The audio for this video was all recorded through high quality portable devices from Presonus, directly into my PowerBook. I did this to demonstrate a portable system that was able to record great sounding tracks and that could easily be moved to a remote location. This instructional video is presented courtesy of Presonus Incorporated. Let's take a look at four primary considerations in building a drum sound. Mic choice, mic placement, signal path management, and acoustical surroundings. The mic you use and where you put it dramatically affect the recorded drum sound. Mic choice and placement should be the first options that you vary to get the drum sound you want. It's common to utilize condenser mics for overheads, hi-hat, and room mics. Moving coil mics are most commonly used to close mic the toms, snare, and kick. On any drum, the attack comes from the center of the drum head, and the pure tone comes from the outer few inches near the rim. Generally, the mic sound is full close to the source and thin far from the source. Notice when I point the mic at the center, the attack is stronger, and when I point the mic toward the shell, the tone is fuller. Using a mic like the Shure Beta 56 lets you position the mic more out of the drummer's way. It's common to mic the top and bottom of the snare. I like to use the moving coil on top and a condenser underneath. Anytime you have two mics that point at each other, they are out of phase. So always invert the phase of the bottom mic. A moving coil mic like the Shure Beta 57 is typically used on each tom. Notice how the sound changes as I move the mic in relation to the drum. Sometimes one mic is used to cover two toms. For most applications, you need at least three or four mics, one each for the kick and snare, along with one or two overheads. This setup lets you control the tone and volumes of the kick and snare separate from the rest of the kit. This is usually necessary to provide the appropriate amount of impact in the mix. It's ideal to close mic the kit in order to have the most control over each drum and so that effects such as reverb can be applied only to the intended sounds. It's most common to record drum tracks without equalization, leaving final sound shaping for the mix down process. On each close mic drum, evaluate the three primary frequency ranges, lows, mids, and highs. A parametric equalizer provides the best control of the recorded tone. Listen first for the portion of the tone that's getting in the way of the tone you want to achieve. Most commercial drum sounds utilize close miking, which provides adequate isolation for shaping the tone and volume of each instrument. However, 
close miking from a distance of one to three inches often provides a cloudy sound that's a little too thick in the lower mid-range between about 300 and 600 hertz. The mids often obstruct the sound of the highs and lows. They get in the way of the attack and depth of the tone. Watch as I adjust the EQ on these close miked drums. When it comes to the room you record in, size matters. In any room, the reflections from the surfaces in the room affect the recorded sound as they combine at the mic with the close sound. In a small room, reflections and standing waves are short, often causing a hollow, thick, unappealing sound. In a large room, the reflections that combine at the mic are much longer, creating a feeling of space. Drums recorded in a large room typically sound bigger, have more tone, and blend together better than drums recorded in a small room. With gear getting smaller and more portable, take a chance, get out of the house, search for a great room to record in, and use it for the tracks that benefit most from it. The following drums were recorded in a church not far from my house. <laughs> These guidelines provide a great place to start recording drums. For more information about how to get great recorded sounds, refer to the Smart Guide series from Thompson Publishing.